Welcome to Big Blend Radio with your hosts, Lisa and Nancy, editors of BigBlendMagazine.com. Welcome to Big Blend Radio's Toast to the Art Show with Nancy and Lisa, the crazy mother-daughter travel team and publishers of Big Blend Magazines. We're excited to have Victoria Chick back on the show today. Uh, Victoria is based in Silver City, New Mexico, a beautiful art community and destination. She is a contemporary figurative artist and early 19th, 20th century print collector. Sometimes she allows you to buy the print. Sometimes not. <laughs> it all depends. <laughs> I encourage you to go to her website, uh, victoriachick.com, uh, to view her work, her print collection, and also to read her articles on different artists and uh, just different art topics. Uh, she joins us here on Big Blend Radio every month, and her articles are featured in Big Blend Radio and TV magazine and in Parks and Travel magazine. And today she's going to talk about the American Impressionist Child Hassam. I'm going to get it right. I'm going to get it right. So it's Child Hassam. Interesting name, and she's going to tell us a little bit about his uh, ancestry as well, and uh, his family's ancestry, and his work here in America as one of our top impressionists. And uh, her article about Child uh, Hassam is in the September-October issue of Big Blend Radio and TV magazine, uh, but you can also go right to blendradioandtv.com. Hi, Victoria. How are you? Hi, Lisa. I'm glad to talk to you today. I and this child Hossum, he does have an interesting name, and it, it has an interesting history. I I, uh, I never knew for years exactly how I should pronounce it because I, I never heard it pronounced. And I was contorting it in different ways. But it's, it is child, even though it has an E on the end of it. And Hassam is a sort of a corruption over the years of his his ancestor's name, which was Horsham, H-O-R-S-H-A-M. And he was from England, and uh, that family, branches of the family came to the United States uh, back in the 1700s, 1800s, excuse me. And uh, kind of just, as you, if you say it fast enough, it turns into Hassam. So, and... Uh, he he pronounced it sometimes because he, he liked to be considered sort of his exotic. And so sometimes he would pronounce it Hassam, but the rest mm. of the family would, you know, they didn't like that they, because it was, to them it was Hassam, Hassam. Mm. And, um, but he, in addition to, to pronouncing it and sort of encouraging the idea that he was from the mysterious Middle East at the, at the time, anyway, mysterious. Uh, he also would put the a little. He would sign his paintings, and then he would put a little uh, like a quarter moon behind his signature. So that that quarter moon would be like the quarter moon that's on the Turkish flag. So he really encouraged being considered exotic. Oh, see, I maybe love that. maybe his parents really didn't name him, and they just called him, "Hey, child, come here." I know. <laughs> Well, actually, I think he did. He had a relative. He was actually his first name was named after somebody in the family, an uncle or somebody. Now, oh. I, whether that was his uncle's first name or his uncle's last name, I'm not sure. Wow, you know, it's it's interesting huh. because when I first read his name, and and you know what, you were on our show last month with Kristen over from Weir Farm, uh, where uh, uh, Julian mm -hmm. Alden Weir, that is, you know, our national right. park dedicated to the visual arts, which is is fascinating that story but this is how I started to know about him um through Julian Weir um and I didn't I didn't I didn't know this whole big legacy of American Impressionists if I heard the word Impressionism I always thought it was a French French artist you know that's mm -hmm. my immediate thing was it's all French I never thought of it coming over to America until you're like hey this is how this happened and then we had the 10 painters <laughs> and you know, right. I, I read his name and I love his work. I really like his painting. And, but I thought it was until you were on the show, then I just like copied you, Victoria, <laughs> after that. I <laughs> well, thought it was that's okay because I was Hassam. probably copying somebody else. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I thought it was Childe Hassam. And, you know, yeah. But it's, well, it, you know, why not? You know, you, okay. unless you, unless you know, you, you <laughs> feel like you feel kind of funny. So that when these names that are so unfamiliar to us. 
But um, and he he came from he Boston, uh, he, though, right? he probably would have enjoyed your being a little bit uncomfortable with it. <laughs> I think yeah, I think he'd enjoy this conversation. But I mean, we're going back to 1859 when he was born in Boston, right? So that's, that's right. His, that's correct. So the New England um, seems to be a hotbed of impressionism. Well, at the time, uh, there weren't a lot of painters anywhere else in the United States except except out right on the East Coast, and there are few on the on the very far West Coast, uh, especially the Pacific Northwest. There were some people painting there at the time, but uh, it was he he had parents that encouraged him to a degree when he was in, like in grade school and junior like a junior high school level. He was going to a nice private school and he was taking art lessons as part of that and music lessons but um his father lost his business when when uh, child Hassan was just about 17 he had his building his business burned at burned to the ground i guess in, in boston wow. boston had a fire in the in their downtown commercial area like the chicago fire it you know it destroyed everything so um his, they were went from being fairly well off um, to being not so well off, and so he, his child has some uh, quit school because he wanted to help support his family, his parents, and he had an uncle at the time, which I I didn't have this in my article, but I thought it was interesting. His uncle was still pretty well off and offered to send him to Harvard, even though he had taken he had come out of school, you know he said. So could kind of quiz him to Harvard because uh, if you knew enough stuff and could afford it. So, uh, but mm. they t he turned him down. He decided he he didn't. He wanted to be on his own. He wanted to make his own way. So that's what he did. Uh, his father got him a job at a publisher, uh, which I still think is that publisher is still in existence, Brown Little uh, oh. Publishing Company or Little Brown, and he was he put him in the accounting department. Well, this did not work out. We had some creative accounting weeks, coming up. You know, yeah. his, his, his career as an accountant only lasted three weeks. Oh, hmm. And um, the um, the manager suggested, I put that in quotation, suggested that he needed another line of work. <laughs> because what he was doing in the accounting department was he was drawing. He wasn't, hmm. he wasn't ciphering numbers. He just was drawing all the time. And so... The manager suggested he try to be an artist since he was doing that anyway, <laughs> and um, so that's what he did. You know, I, he took he took the sarcasm as a good suggestion and went into kind of apprenticed himself to a wood engraver, which was was and he became mm -hmm. a commercial wood engraver for several years, and but then he started taking painting lessons again. He, was, he went to the uh, Lowell Institute. He went to the Boston Art Club. And he, his favorite medium was watercolor. But he also did oil painting. And it uh, didn't take him maybe like four or five years before he was having major exhibitions in Boston, and particularly his watercolors. So, so watercolors, because he, he, he doesn't, when you look at his work, it looks very oil Basically. Yes, I think what what I think when he was later on, I think people people wanted to buy oil paintings more than they wanted to buy watercolors, mm -hmm. um, and okay. so he did a lot of oil paintings. He he was he was had an amazing number of artworks that he produced in his life. I read and they're all that different. He, they're all different. Yeah, like the, yeah. he didn't just stick to he, nature or landscapes. He yeah, did a little right. bit of everything. He, yeah, he did. He would do anything. And he mm. did figures, nudes, portraits, you know, the gamut. And he did over 3,000 paintings in his wow. life. Wow, that's a lot. And he also wow. did some lithography and he did some etching. When he got older, he did some etching. I, that may have been a medium that was easier for him at the time. Hmm. Um, in addition to all the drawings he did. So he was very prolific. Hmm. I, I love to hear artists that you'll know, get into different things like that, you know, mm -hmm. and and I know yeah. with you, um, you're always looking at engravers mm -hmm. and illustrators and, and uh, so this must have been fun to, you know, research him on this to see the, the it, it was and I, I had never been aware that he did any kind of printmaking at all. So yeah. that was interesting to me. And now I'm on the lookout. 
<laughs> for See, I knew it. Yeah. As soon as I saw yeah. that in your article, I'm like, yeah. uh oh, here yeah. she goes. <laughs> she, here she goes. Well, he, he, I I really enjoy his work, but he also he traveled a lot, didn't he? Oh yeah. Uh, he traveled. Well, he traveled uh, when, when he was a young man. I don't. I don't think he ever went into war with his parents because his parents were like. They worked, <laughs> but um, and they collected they collected stuff too, um, antiques, and they were into furniture and some painting. Um, so he he was aware of what was going on around the world, probably as far as mm -hmm. art goes. Um, he went to he went to France quite a bit because that was where if you were if you were on the East Coast and if you wanted to be an artist seriously. You would try to go to France because by that time, the 18th century, France was the art capital of the world. Um, before that, it had been, it had been Rome, but every, things kind of shifted, and everybody wanted to go to Paris. And so it was a real hotbed of, of artists from all over the world. And there were several good um, schools that taught art in a more of a classical way. Um, mm. They taught they, they the when I say classical we've talked about this before you and I but mm. uh, for your listeners that might not be aware of what I mean by classical uh, classical work in the in the 17th and 18th century mirrored the painting style of the old masters Italian masters however the subject matter was always lofty what they considered to be lofty so it was uh, very very precise very hard edged very well defined but the subject matter was like greek mythology subjects or roman mythology or uh it might be uh some terrible war where there would be an allegorical figure like holding a flag or um some some subject that was removed in time from when when it was actually being painted, and that was hmm. considered it was considered you know good art. That's in capital letters, and anything else uh, like the realists that were coming up, where the, the subject matter was everyday people, that was considered bad art <laughs> with capital letters by the oh. people in the academy. And so, la di da. When we hmm. when we get to impressionism, they're they're style is has changed to very loose brushwork, uh, brighter colors, but they're still painting everyday subject matter, like people in a park or people out in a bar or at a picnic. You know, so um it, mm. it the whole the the subject matter was the big change, I think. And it took a it took a while for people to accept the the subject matter because mm. you know they wanted things that were considered beautiful by the experts and uh, the experts didn't like <laughs> didn't like it didn't like impressionism initially it, it's so funny because the music industry goes through this and I think if you're a creative you want to do what you want to do and it's and also sometimes it's it's hard for I think even no matter in if you know it's a being a creative individual that it's Sometimes you still get into a comfort zone in art, and sometimes right. you have to go against the grain, even if you you right. don't like well, it. That's because, true. Because half of the impressionists, I know, like we were talking about this before with um, a, a Julian Alden Weir, he he didn't like impressionism, and then next you no. know he's like the American master of it. <laughs> it's so right. funny. That's true. It's true. It's it's very very interesting how the, the artistic taste changed among artists. Mm. Among a lot of artists, not not all of them, of course, but um, he was he was he was one who finally gave, you know he finally decided that was what he wanted to do. And uh, Child Hassam, although he was attending this you know this academy that dealt you know in teaching him how to do classical art, he was aware of all the impressionist artists that were out there, not as not at his school, but they what they were doing. So he was really attracted to that. Hmm. Uh, he it, it it didn't take him very long at all to switch his style his painting style. 
and to really adopt it. And he never gave it up. I mean, all his whole life, he, even even though as other styles came in, other movements came in, um, he stuck to Impressionism because that, you know, just satisfied him so, so well. Hmm. It must be more fun. I mean, oh, I yeah, I'm sure. It's way more fun to swirly brush around than having to be so hard-edged <laughs> and refined, yeah. like, you know, and everything has to look exactly mm-hmm. the way it is exactly right. the way you're you know i mean i have to laugh one of his paintings is called the victorian chair I and mean, there is a woman <laughs> sitting in it but it's really about the chair yeah right it's not yeah. a whole chair it's just the corner of the chair yeah yep. you know and it's kind of like it's the movement and the yeah. architecture of it the the craftsmanship of it but yeah. what i also thought was interesting is in, in your article too you were talking about he you know there's and it, it's kind of interesting because ted de has kind of got that too where you don't have to fill the whole piece of canvas, but, or like you you have paint, but you don't have to. It could be loose. It could be, you know what I mean. That there's raw canvas. Right. That's me. And he canvas. he painted very very quickly. That was hmm. one one of the things he he was he was considered by a lot of the uh, artists and a lot of the critics after impressionism uh, got really well established in America. He was considered probably the most radical of the impressionists because he painted so quickly, and he mm-hmm. his brush would just sort of dance across the canvas, and you know he would do many 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 strokes, sometimes almost a dry brush technique where he would put his you could see his stroke down barely, and there would be a lot of the raw canvas that would show through the paint film, and he liked that. Uh, I think he he thought it contributed to the freshness of impressionism and the mm-hmm. airiness uh, of all, especially a lot of his outdoor subjects. You know, and so that you had the the ten. I keep I keep wanting to call them the top ten, but that's that's not true <laughs> at all. It's the ten painters. So it's like the you know it's like it, it's interesting how you know here it comes you know we're going to have this group and then there was. Um, you know, the, the New York Watercolor Club and the Society of American Artists. And here we go, all the different organizations and clubs. But right. what happened? I mean, did they all just have a fight or something? Like, what happened to well, the painters? Did they say, that's it? I, or, I'm I mean, not, was it just a time There were differences. They had a difference of opinion. Because in a way, it was like a, a carryover from the people uh, that had learned to paint, maybe the older artists that had learned to paint as a, as a classical style, as as um, a more uh, a more refined, I'll say, um, less exuberant kind of of application of the paint on the canvas than impressionism produced. Mm-hmm. Um, so they saw some of them, enough of them probably saw that as sloppy painting because <laughs> they, it was it was it was just totally new and it wasn't what they were used to. And so, and it was a pretty big group to American Society of American Artists was a pretty large group. Um, And Hmm. they probably just had a difference of philosophy. And I don't think they had a big fight or anything like that, but some of them decided that, you know, they, they didn't, if, if their work, you know, the impressionists decided if their work wasn't going to be respected by the group, they would just leave, and they did, and uh, formed yeah. this other group called the Ten Painters, mm-hmm. which and they who all these painters had adopted impressionism as the way they wanted to work, the mm-hmm. way they saw life. They saw it as airy. They saw it as um, as colorful. They saw complementary colors. They saw light. They saw colors in the shadows. They broke up the paint on the canvas. They didn't blend it um, on their palette before they applied it to the canvas. They didn't mix it completely. So there was just there were just a lot of differences in the way they worked than than the older style. And that's it. And I mean, there's nothing wrong with the older style. I don't I don't want to sound like I'm putting it down. It, but it was it was it reflected a certain period in time. And like certain when Dylan went electric. That they did not they didn't yeah. share the outlook. Yeah. It's it's so, Elvis Presley. Yeah. It's Elvis Presley of, of the art world. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah. Buddy Holly and Elvis Presley. Yeah. 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 If they were artists they would have been these two. Exactly. 
I wonder what they would have thought of, of abstract paintings. Because well, they didn't like it. No, see, they were just they were just as rigid in their own way as as the classical artists because they they had adopted impressionism and when impressionism in our impressionism per se started to fade sort of around 1900 it was it, it was being supplanted by more by expressionism mm. and then you had you had Van Gogh for instance and Gauguin that were painting and so. To, to the impressionists, that stuff was junk. <laughs> and they, you know, they didn't want to be associated with it. It's very interesting, I think. People people are people, and uh, mm. they learn away. And uh, by George, they're comfortable with it, and they don't want anybody to rock the boat. So, but, but they so, rock the um, boat first. See, that's what's so... I mean, so, everybody takes turns so, of rocking the boat. That's the only thing that... That's what that's that's life. That's change, you know. Yeah, yeah. I I, I mean, think, I never wanted to paint abstract, but in one of my classes, I was forced to paint an abstract. Mm -hmm. And no matter how hard I tried, the professor was like, "Well, that's not abstract. I can tell exactly what it is." You know, so I everyone's mean, different. Yeah, yeah. What they want to do. It was like, yeah, it, it's the abstract thing wasn't something right. I was comfortable. Even mm. thinking about, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, and we're, we're up, all wired a little differently. So yeah, some thank of us, goodness. you know, it's, yeah, it's, exactly. exactly. That's why we're the blend, Viva Variety, everybody. <laughs> right. <laughs> there used to be a TV show called Viva Variety, and it was it was almost like a vaudeville kind of show. It was on Comedy Central. I mean, I mean, this is like when we first got back here. This got to be at least twenty years ago, I think. And this guy would get up on stage. It was like the gong show in a, in a weird way. And he'd go, <laughs> Viva Variety. And that was it. I was like, okay, there it is. That's what I want to do. Right. <laughs> variety is the spice of life. The one thing I wanted to touch on with him too, uh, Hassam, child Hassam, I'm getting his name right, is yep. what he was doing in regards to in, in World War One, And he was using his paintings, you know, what to encourage uh, the people to buy war bonds yes yeah um he did this wonderful series of paintings um 28 or 29 of them i think of their their paintings of flags flying what they used to do in in new york when when there would be some major event um in britain in, in this time this time it was uh world war one and they were trying to raise war bonds and they would have parades through the streets on on mm -hmm. Fifth Avenue and uh, and they would hang these flags from high above on the on the buildings at the time they were large flags and there would be you know dozens and dozens of american flags and other kinds of flags um, and so he did he did these the ones i I like the best are seen like if the artist was was on an upper floor too, so he's fairly close to the flags, and the street is far down, far down on the picture plane. So you're looking, you're kind of looking at a parade through the flags as the flags are flying, and they're they're they are painted very loosely, so it's, it's a, the colors in them are almost kaleidoscopic to me. And um, you really get the sense that the wind is whipping these flags, moving the colors around, because uh, the brushwork is so free and loose. But he did those um, to raise money uh, for, for war bonds, he to encourage people to buy war, war bonds. Uh, they, they weren't buying the paintings. The, the money he went for the paintings wasn't going for that. He, it was just kind of to increase patriotic feeling um, of the people the people that saw them and he want, his, his desire was that after the war was over all those flags should be shown always together mm -hmm. so you would always that wh whoever the viewer was would have the sense of being surrounded by the flags and they would they would be still be caught up in the feeling that of, of a unified United States, the feeling, and so um, he was very disappointed that that never happened. 
they were they were never they were never shown together that I know of. Um, wow! Wow! So that's, anyway, that's kind of the story on the flag paintings, but um, they're really striking paintings. You know, it's it's amazing how you know patriotism goes through, and and patriotism in I mean that word has been tossed around a lot now. But it is, yeah. it's about people being patriotic to their country, whether or not it's the same belief system, you know, um, right. caring and doing what they, you know, how, you know, it's just amazing. You know, over the years, you, you've brought people up about that, you know, that they're using yeah. their paintings politically. And, and I think when you do that, well, you, you're, you're making hard, a stand, you know. It's hard not to mix politics in sometimes. And then we try to stay away from it because people get whatever their viewpoint is, they can get overly stimulated <laughs> one way or another. in a bunch. <laughs> <laughs> and, but, you know, when he, when he was painting these, I mean, it was 19, what did I say, 1916 to 1918 when he was, when this was going on. And, and I think, you know, when, then when the war was over, there had also had a big parade down Fifth Avenue for the, hmm. when, when all the uh, soldiers came home. So, but there, but there was a feeling of the country, even though we were a country of immigrants to a large extent, there was a common feeling about yeah. being American mm-hmm. and um, and wanting to pull together. So, mm-hmm. um, I don't. I mean, I think that that patriotism meant something different than uh, wasn't as fragmented. It was it was way more of a common feeling than it is right now. Yeah, I think yeah. I think that's it's apparent and that's how I again how you know our history is in paintings, you know, in right. music. You know, it's like I want to start looking at paintings in era different eras and take the music of that era and kind of put them together. Yeah. And mm-hmm. see if they they're the matching, you know what I mean? It's just interesting, yes. you know, uh when you start looking at that and that it, it's then just seeing the sounds and, and the colors. I think colors, you know, we we were talking about this the other night, that color really represents things. And I, and we were watching, um, oh, there's this new TV show, No Passport Required. It's, it's about the food of everyone that's come to this country, you know, different immigration communities, or not immigration, but, you know, people have immigrated here. And, you know, so all these different cultures, you know, all these different foods that are available in right. this country. I can, you know, you can go to Little Haiti in Miami and, you know, there's all these different, you know, go to Detroit, you're going to have this kind of food. You can go to, you know, New York, you can have Ethiopian food, you know. So we were watching this and, and learning these stories of how people got here and mm-hmm. how sometimes they were slaves in another country and then ended up here. And, you know, but and and really this one lady was talking about how like emotionally they had to move forward like because you've lost your homeland you you separated from your families and how food was one of those ways to comfort them to move forward and to do things and progress and it unified like what you're talking about too you know all these you know immigrants coming together saying okay we're going to create this country together we're going to do these things and they do but one thing Nancy and I realized, and we were talking about this, that um, other cultures use color as part of their life, you know, color on the houses. When you go to Mexico, mm-hmm. houses are different colors. And sure. you see, I have a feeling like even the way, you know, dressing and things, I wonder if we always talk about how people have this resilience, resiliency. And I wonder, I know that there's like the village and, you know, that kind of unity, but I'm wondering how much color plays a role in resiliency of people and keeping happy and upbeat no matter how th- how bad things may be <clears throat> that having well, color around yeah. you shifts your mood. Yeah. You I'm, I'm sure I'm sure color we all react to color and uh, I mean yeah just different different cultures I mean just certain colors mean different things in different mm-hmm. cultures so you can't say you know, make an across the board statement, but but yes, I'm sure that the, that the color that people surround them with affects how they feel. And mm-hmm. brighter colors, you know, may you may be right on that that um, you're happier, you're happier <laughs> with brighter colors. 
you know? Yeah, you know, because I was wondering, like, if that's going to change in painting history, like when you start looking at art, you know, what the colors were being used and, you know, in different eras or where the artists were coming from. Um, the history of color, well, that's the next topic. I, yeah. <laughs> well, I, know I don't, I don't, I, 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 you know, I'd have to think about that, about mm -hmm. as far as eras go, because some eras are, well, not even eras, some like, some centuries are affected. The color is is de determined by what was available at the, you know, as far as, as earth pigments or you know other or brighter dyes or you know whatever. So you can see you can see a change in color. But uh, mm -hmm. I know in certain certain paintings, I mean, if you've got a painting, an artist who wants to express a certain feeling, that definitely color is going to be a big play a big role in 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 that mm -hmm. presentation of the feeling that he wants to express. Mm -hmm. That's true. And so you're saying that yeah. about food. Yeah, that, you know, chefs always say they like to put as many different colors in their food as possible. Yeah, yeah. And it, to make it pop, you know, so mm -hmm. it's attractive. Yeah, and it's appetizing. Victoria, you talk yep. about that in your cooking recipe. I Everybody, <laughs> you got to go to blendradiontv.com yeah. and type in Moroccan chicken, and you'll find Victoria giving us a cooking class on how to make Moroccan chicken, and we know it's good because we had it. Because we filmed it, <laughs> and that's that's the coolest thing. I think we'll just keep doing that for the rest of our life. Is go around and film people make food. Because <laughs> that was good chicken. I was like, as Nancy was putting the video together, I'm like, dude, <laughs> this is so good. I remember it. But you were talking about the color, how you ch you chose the vegetables according to color, and you know that's it's interesting. You're like, I'm an artist, mm -hmm. so I have to have color on my plate. <laughs> there you go. Well, I like it. Yeah. That's that cool. was fun. That was fun. Uh, but everybody, again, uh, victoriachick.com is the website to go to. And of course, her article is in the September, October issue of Big Blend Radio and TV magazine. But you can go to blendradioandtv.com. Just type in Victoria. You'll find all her articles. I have a special song for you, Victoria. Oh, you do? And this one, it's an instrumental. I think I've played his music on, on a show with you before. His name is, uh, he's a guitarist, John Durant. He's, he's awesome. And uh, this is off of his album, Parting Is. And when you listen, you it just you just don't even believe that it's one person playing a guitar. It's really oh, wow. fascinating. It's beautiful music, and um, I just I chose this song. It's called Clouds in Advance because it mm. has that it's mood. You, you you feel nature. You feel the clouds okay. when you listen. I'm sure I'll enjoy it. That's what impressionism does to me. Is that they have movement in the painting. Mm -hmm. You feel and that you know. So I feel like. It's like I know you're a figurative painter, uh, Victoria, but it's it's that similar thing, that moment, that that little there's that moment of movement of what people are going to do. So it's, I think it's connected. All right. I know I'm doing a painting right, right now of a cloud. I just started a giant painting of a cloud, so I will I will really oh, listen yeah. to this music with attention. Oh wow. Oh, cool, cool. cool. I was going to make sure you get the whole album on that because it's it's beautiful music, absolutely beautiful. And he's from Boston or Massachusetts, okay. and he comes out to uh, Portland or Willamette um, every few months or so. And he and he likes to cook too. When he came on our right. radio show, we had happy hour, and then we ended up talking about food all the time. <laughs> well. Go. You know, it's, yeah. It's well, we get, we're getting all the sense. We're getting all the senses here. We're getting the auditory, the visual, and the uh, gustatory sense here, and right. uh, they all go together. You know, sounds good. Sounds good. Uh, everybody, thank sounds you. Like a party. I know. Thanks for joining <laughs> us here on Big Blend Radio. Our shows air Sunday through Friday. Just go to BigBlendRadio.com. The schedule's there. You can listen as shows go live on BlogTalkRadio.com or any of the other networks at any time. Uh, including Spotify now. Uh, we're now on iHeart, TuneIn Radio, um, I should say TuneIn.com, iTunes, on YouTube, on Player.fm, Spreaker, SoundCloud, all kinds of places. So BigBlendRadio.com is the place to go. And thanks again, Victoria. Always fun to have you on the show. It's always a pleasure talking to you, too. Here it is. Here it is, everybody. Clouds in advance. Uh, again, from guitarist John Durant. You go to his website, johndurant.com. That's J-O-N-D-U-R-A-N-T. I'm just proving I can spell. Here it is. <laughs>